When we are young, there is a special place that makes the beauty of words come alive for the first time. As we stretch our minds and cast our lines into uncharted waters, the same haven helps us to navigate the past we seek to pave. As we uncover, redefine, and expand our minds, we bring the world closer to our fingertips. We come here to build dreams. We feed the imagination through the wonder of stories. Here, there are no boundaries for us. We come to discover and to connect. This is a space to ponder the greatest unknowns and question everything. We find and spread our wings here. Knowledge becomes power. We bridge gaps between divides through the pursuit of answers and understanding. We create the amazing when information is readily in our hands. Here, we open doors to the wealth of lessons in our past. We shape our present with these tools and move in confidence toward the future. This place is the gateway, the link to learning that leaves nothing out of touch. This place belongs to us. But before we get underway, uh, I have two brief, I promise, but important uh, recognitions. Uh, first, I'd like for us to take a moment to um, join together in appreciation of the library staff. Uh, they're the ones who make our use of the library enjoyable, and we want to recognize them and their efforts, especially today, our circulation manager, Juanita Easley, who is uh, celebrating, celebrating 20 years with the library system. Thank you. Um, okay, so next up, if you'll think back to 2016, the, the library celebrated its 75th anniversary. And to mark this milestone, the library board created the Helen Foster Award. Um, as you know, Mrs. Helen Foster was, uh, uh, you know, pivotal in the establishment of the Lee County Library in 1941. She served as one of our very first library board members, and she also uh, established the Helen Foster Lecture Series, which provides uh, exceptional program over the years on important topics beneficial to our community. And the award goes to honor her legacy and to those who continue in that spirit today. And uh, I wanna welcome Dr. Debbie Jones of the Library Board to come forward to present this year's Helen Foster Award. I'd like to say thank you for everyone for attending this great event here in the city of Tupelo. This is really awesome how we can partner and work together. This award is really a prestigious award. Um, the Helen Foster Award for Library Advocacy and Support. This year, our number knee was actually nominated by Albin Bennett from Saltillo, Mississippi. And I am so proud to share with you exactly what she said. <laughs> she said, Dear Helen Foster Award, for Library Advocacy Committee. It's with great pleasure that I write to you today to nominate this special person in our community, Ms. Becky Rollins. I 
I believe that Becky is the best choice for the award because she has consistently displayed acts of advocacy, service, and support to the Lee County Library. Since 2015, Becky has served the, as the Lee County Library in many ways, and she said numerous ways. Under her leadership, the library has been able to increase, basically, its funding. Efforts through community being visible and to provide resources and support to the library, their staff, and volunteers. As being elected president of the Friends of the Library, Ms. Rollins has also led the library in its funding efforts to new heights. She has been the creator of the quote and unquote, a novel affair. And I would like to plug in here, if you've never been, you need to purchase a ticket. <laughs> this fundraising event, which features many chefs that she has asked to come to this area, they are very profound uh, chefs. Uh, for example, uh, one was Robert St. John, was one of the chefs. And they actually cooked live before the audience. Some of the chefs also put together and coordinated organizing and delegating events uh, for the fundraiser. Ms. Rollins' tireless efforts in coordinating, organizing, and delegating has raised amount over $200,000 for the library. <laughs> Becky is a servant leader, jumping in to assist with any tasks given work to be done. A fun story about her, that was heard and documented <laughs> is that Becky said that if you get hurt or anything, you can run out and get peroxide from a nearby dollar store because according to Becky, quote, mama says peroxide fixes everything, unquote. <laughs> In addition, under Becky's guidance, the Library Endowment Fund has grown to over $70,000. Becky is a fierce advocate for the library. She has demonstrated many other eventful uh, matters for the library and shown and given her time and energy. She has also worked diligently with the director here at the library, also with the Board of Supervisors. And finally, the writer said, I strongly endorse Becky's nomination for the Helen Foster Award for Library Advocacy and believe that her contributions make her the best candidate for this award. I hope you will consider my nomination and I hope that I've displayed Becky's capabilities and contributions effectively. Thank you for your time. And as always, thank you sincerely, Albin Bennett. At this time, we would like for Becky Rollins to come forward. Thank you so much. Uh, listen, I just want to say that Catherine Mize is here today. And Catherine Mize, when I moved here 10 years ago, Catherine, 10 years ago, we went to lunch. And um, she said, so what do you like to do? And I go, eh, you know, I don't do much. I taught school. And, you know, I like to read. And she goes, well, I need to introduce you to Babe Gratz because she is, runs that library. And I said, OK. And so I went and had lunch with Babe. And uh, Babe said, well, let's go meet the new librarian. He said, we got a new director. Let's go meet him. And so we came and we met. 
And that was it, y'all. We, uh, I have stories that I could tell you about Jeff that I maybe will write a book one day. But uh, yeah, so true. And uh, yeah, I opened my big fat mouth at the time and said, well, what kind of fundraisers do you do? And they both go, we, we don't. And, and I said, well, and then Debbie, I think you said, well, let's do it. And I said, okay. I said, so we did it. So we started a novel affair. And as you know, that's been going on for a while. And in fact, it's coming up in the next couple of weeks. So if you don't have your ticket, you might want to get your ticket. It's going to be great. And it's going to have local chefs. Let me just plug that now. Uh, but I am among great people that have received this your award. Lisa, Jack, Babe, Dan, Francis. I'm among Julie, uh, good, uh, Goodwin's mother. I mean, I'm among really special people, which it's, it's an honor to me, but I just want to thank you all so much. It's just, it's, it's just a great honor. And my daughter just happens to be in town and her new, and her uh, fiance, and, and Dan's here, so that should all scare us all that he's here. <laughs> so again, Alban. No words. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. It was a shock, and I really appreciate it. Jeff, you know I love you, and uh, we've had some good times and some good runs, and I hate that this is... I know you're just giving this to me because you're leaving. And uh, uh, Bonnie, thank you for everything that I asked you to do, all the weird things, and you would look at me like, mm, is she okay? And thank you for everything. And the staff, gosh, you know, you know when I came in here and y'all like, oh God, here she is again. And all of you that saw me coming, you knew I wanted money, thank you, and thank you for not running. And uh, we just really, the, Dan and I can't say enough about Tupelo. We love this town. Y'all have embraced us, and you've made us feel so special in this town, and I just cannot thank you enough, so thank you. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Reed, and we'll begin. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming, and congrats to Becky. Where'd she go? She's, oh, yay. Okay, and I saw Dan, too, and I thought, hmm, hadn't seen it. So anyway, so well-deserved. I'm glad you, you are the recipient. Um, welcome to our 12th annual Tupelo Reads, a community-wide conversation about a book. And in the past 12 years, we've hosted authors like Winston Groom, Rick Bragg, Beth Ann Finley, Kent Kruger, our own Smitty Harris, and Sarah Berry. Today, we're thrilled to present New York Times bestselling author, Jamie Ford. Um, I want to say that we had to reschedule this, and I know a lot of you know that. And Jamie was willing and game to do whatever. And he was on his laptop at the Great Falls, Montana airport. And Jack and I were in our pajamas. It was like 6.30 in the morning because Memphis was iced in, trying to, to get him to Nashville. Or, and he was game to do whatever until his flight out of Great Falls finally got canceled about 11 that morning. So we had to redo. And I'm thinking perhaps Great Falls, Montana, Tupelo, Mississippi is not the easiest uh, trek we could have worked out. But anyway, so glad that he was flexible and can come this week and you, that you could be here too. Each year we've been able to host these wonderful authors like Jamie to speak at the library and at Tupelo High School and put on a juried art show. And let me do, do a commercial for these kids for a minute. He went there this morning, and he is so well met. Um, a personal note here, he's so easy because the kids had not had time to read the book. They had barely talked about it, but he was able to morph about being a writer, and they were totally engaged, and he did a great job. But the art teacher there is Anna Garner. And she works with Julie and Liz, every, Liz McIntosh on our committee, and the, the kid, the art students, senior art students, do something in regard to the book. And her theme was I Am this year, sort of reflecting on Afong Moy or Keiko in, in Hotel on the Board, Bittersweet, Who Am I? And they did things from I Am Japanese to I Am Exhausted or I Am Emotional or you know, anyway, they're very deep, and we were just, I thought they were very vulnerable, so please, please look at those. You'll be very impressed with what the kids did. But anyway, that's part, we give cash prizes for that, too, out of our Tupelo Reads account, and so we do that, and usually a curriculum at the Boys and Girls Club. So we've been able to do this thanks to funding from the city of Tupelo and the Friends of the Library and Reads Gumtree Bookstore. Glad I have an in there. That's helpful. So... I wanted to note, though, that we've never had a fundraiser, we've never asked for money, 
We've been self-sustaining, and all the work is done by volunteers. And so, committee, please stand up, because a lot of you are up here, and, I, I'm at, and they're great, Harold. Um, so, so the work is all done by them. And, but I wanted to know that there is a Tupelo Reads account at CREATE. And so we have had individuals make donations before, which is very helpful. So if you do enjoy this bringing in great authors and you want to do that or so inspired to do that, that would just be great. And so that said, I wanted to relay some very exciting news. Last month, I received a call from Margaret Ann Robbins, who is here today. Margaret Ann? Where are you? Back there. Uh, fellow North Mississippian who's a member of the Board of Governors of the Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters. The acronym is MIAL. The MIAL was founded in 1978 by Governor William Winter, who's uh, spoken here in our program before, and other literary and arts-minded citizens to celebrate and honor Mississippi artists, musicians, and writers. And each year, the MIAL honors creative Mississippians with awards in their specific field, fiction, nonfiction, visual arts, mu music, jazz, whatever. But this year, Tupelo Reads has been chosen to receive a special distinction award from the MIAL because of the scope of our partnerships and the programming around a book and an author, which they say is unique in our state. So we were obviously thrilled, and to make Tupelo a place of lifelong learning is a mission of the program, so we're really thrilled to be recognized on a statewide level from an organization that values the arts and the humanities in our state. So we thank Margaret Ann for nominating us, and please help me to celebrate this. And your support, your support is surely part of this, too, so thank you. Now to Jamie. Um, he comes to us from Montana, Great Falls. He was born in Eureka, California, and grew up in Oregon, and then the city, city of Seattle, which is his heart of hearts city, I think. And if you've read his books, you know that setting looms large in both of the books that we're talking about today. His great-grandfather, Min Chung, immigrated from China in 1865 to San Francisco and moved then to Nevada to become a miner. He changed his name to Ford to make things easier for him, but as Jamie said, that thus confused countless following generations. <laughs> he was, Jamie said his grandfather was a stranger in a strange land who wanted to make things better for his children and descendants, and we see this theme echoed poignantly in the stories of Henry and Keiko in the hotel at Corner of Bittern Suite and Afong Moy and her daughters. But both these books inform me about the Chinese coming to America experience. And as many of you know, I didn't really, not being a native Mississippian, but the first Chinese, Jamie knew this, the first Chinese immigrants came to the Delta soon after the Civil War. And by 1900, there was a thriving community there who were farmers and then merchants. Um, Hotel at the Corner of Bitter and Sweet was published in 2009, New York Times bestseller list for two and a half years. It was a number one book club read in 2009, and it was surely an all-time favorite of our book club. I'm sure many of you as well. Many Daughters was published in July of 2022 and quickly selected by, in August by Jenna Bush Hager as a read with Jenna selection for that month. Some of you may have seen Jamie on the Today Show with Jenna and Hoda, and Jenna's production company has optioned the book for a series. So this has been a great year for him, a good gig. He describes himself as a sentimentalist. He writes to create empathy. He's a compassion creator. And though he does write serious and poignant work, he was with us in the committee last night. He's really a lot of fun, and that will come out for you. So we are so happy he's here today and that he could work in trips to the Today Show and the Texas Book Festival and the Miami Book Fair around the most important stop in his tour, which is the Lee County Library in Tupelo, Mississippi. Please give Jamie a warm up. Can you hear me okay? I'm wearing the, uh, oh, double mics, okay. Oh, first thing I wanna do, if you'll indulge me, is. <laughs> okay, everyone smile and say Facebook. 
Um, thank you. Who's on Facebook? Who's on Twitter? Who's on Instagram? Who's on TikTok? Who's not on anything? All right, okay, cool. Excellent, how are those eight track tape collections coming along? They're, they're gonna be worth millions someday on the Antique Road Show. Um, thank you for having me. A quick question, there is no right or wrong answer, but I'm always curious and it helps guide the discussion a little bit. Who here may have read my first book, Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet? Oh, wow, excellent, okay, cool. Um, we don't need to talk about that at all now. <laughs> no, um, books, are, books are like my children. You know, I try to raise them the same way and they go out into the world and they accomplish different things on their own merits. And since most people know me from that first book, I tend to give uh, an update on that book. Um, I say that that book has a career and I'm just along for the ride. <laughs> And I stole that from Pamela Anderson, who said, my boobs have a career, I'm just along for the ride. <laughs> and it's, it's apropos in both instances, I think. Uh, the, the, the more remarkable things that have happened with, uh, with my first novel since it was published, uh, it's been published in a, a lot of foreign languages, but um, by far my, my best foreign market is Norway. I was the number one book in Norway for five months, which is, so weird. <laughs> like I, I did an interview with the largest daily newspaper in Oslo and they're asking me like, what do you attribute all of this success? And I'm like, it's my translator. I, my, I don't speak Norwegian. My translator could put vampires in the book. I would not know. Um, because I, truly, I did not write that book and just pause reflectively and just think, this is gonna rock Oslo, you know? That didn't, that didn't happen. So it was just this, this delight that, uh, that happened and I ended up doing a couple book tours in Norway. Um, my most recent book tour in Norway, I have a Norwegian publicist and we're in Oslo and he wants to take me out to dinner. And Norway is known for its seafood. And so I'm thinking, oh, okay, it's this type of season, we're gonna go out and my foreign Norwegian publicist said, we got this new restaurant. <coughs> They have this really cool food. I want you to try it. It's called a taco. So, um, tacos are everywhere. Tacos are undefeated. Uh, yeah, you can build border walls, but tacos will always go where tacos want to go. Um, it was a wonderful experience. The other thing that's happened with Hotel in the Corner of Bitter and Sweet is that it is read widely in schools now, um, all over the country. At the high school level, some intrepid middle schools and some colleges and universities, but right around the sweet spots like 10th grade, 11th grade. And, and it's weird when you, I grew up and became homework. You know, that's, I, I'm trying to reconcile that in my brain. Um, and it wasn't like one day, no high schools are reading the book and then the next day, 200 high schools are reading the book. It was this slow, organic happening. And the way I became aware of it was because of summer reading. And I raised a house full of teenagers, so I know how summer reading works for kids. They get that summer reading list the last day of school, or approximately, it goes in their backpack, they go home, they toss that backpack in the corner of the room, and that backpack collects dust for most of the summer, and one week before school begins, they dig out that summer reading list, and they all go to this website called sparknotes.com. <laughs> and I'm not there. So there's this collective shriek from 10th graders across the nation in the late August, and I'm not on Sparknotes but I am easy to find on the internet. I'm on social media, they can go to my website and email me. And so now every year in August, I will get 15 to 20 emails per day from high school students asking, well, a typical, uh, an email, and a typical email from a high school student will be something like, uh, Mr. Ford, I loved your book, Motel on the Corner of Sweet and Sour is my all time favorite. <laughs> If you could just answer these 12 questions for me. Um, I, I never, I never, I always respond, but I, I never answer their questions. Because um, a lot of times they'll ask questions like, what's the theme of your book? And I'm like, 
the theme is turn off your Xbox. Say hi to your teacher for me. And, uh, um, but this, this happening, it took a very sharp turn when my own daughter was assigned my book in high school. And it is not cool when your dad is your homework. She was mortified. Um, she, was, I mean, she was just in that sort of butthead teenager phase where parents are wildly uncool. Um, she didn't care if I was a best-selling author or anything. It was just like, oh no. Um, and so what my daughter did is she went on the internet and she found all of these tweets from high school students tweeting about my book. And because she found endless joy sharing these with me, I'm gonna share a few with you. <laughs> these are actual tweets from actual high school students. Um, this one is from Mariah Cobb. And Mariah tweets, nobody read Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. It'll slowly tear out your heart and you'll cry your eyes out. Hashtag stupid English class. Well, that's good. <laughs> um, if you're in the front row, you can kind of see this. It's all in caps. So this young man is very animated. His name's Nicholas Reed, and he is shouting out into the internet universe, who has a study guide for Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet? Sparknotes didn't have it. Hashtag emergency. So, <laughs> Um, this one's from Morgan Gaccioni, and Morgan tweets, anyone want to give me a good summary of Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet? I'm willing to pay in cash. So, <laughs> it's a good little side hustle there. Um, this is from Alana, and uh, her Twitter handle is Banana Alana. It's very sweet. And what sweet little Banana Alana is tweeting is, I would rather read Animal Farm every day of my whole life than effing read Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. Uh, you can feel the love. You can feel the love. She didn't write effing. She wrote the whole thing in case, you're, in case there was some ambiguity of, of uh, Banana Alana's uh, language. And this one is, uh, is my favorite. This is from Emma, and she tweets, more like hotel on the corner of this book sucks boulevard. <sighs> What Emma doesn't realize, I'm fueled creatively by the angst of teenagers. So when, when Emma gets that pimple on prom night, I just get stronger. So it's, a, it's okay. Um, and this, this last one I'm, I'm going to share with you. Um, and this came through Instagram. And I've, you know, I've written three New York Times best-selling books. I've had some good reviews. I've, I've won some awards. Nothing will ever top this as far as... Uh, it's just magic in my memory. Um, dear Jamie Ford, the book Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet was a really good book up until page 369. You sick, twisted jerk. I hate you so much. Why? Why, Jay, why? Why you do that? Why did you make me cry in the car on the way to zip lining? Why the F would you do that to all the people who are forced to read this crappy book? At first, I hated the book, but then Keiko and Henry made me almost sort of tolerate the book. But no, you had to put in Ethel, that witch and pathetic, backstabbing, heartbreaking stealer of how the book was supposed to end. Page 369 broke my heart, like more than when my lizard died. And, and do you know how much I died when my lizard died? Try almost actually dying. So the only way to make it up to me is to make a sequel and make sure that Henry and Keiko end up together and have awesome Chinese and Japanese babies. P.S. I don't mean to be mean or anything. This is just my opinion. So. Uh, I, I'm going to frame that and just put it in my office. It's, it's, a, it's a special, special thing. Um, but I'm here to talk about a new book. And that new book is, is The Many Daughters of Afong Moy. Um, and, you know, this book is about inherited trauma. And that, on the face of it, sounds very heavy. And so I tend to call this book my epigenetic love story. And I, and I do like love stories. It's kind of how my, my brain is wired. I try not to write love stories, and I'm writing this, and it sort of just veers in the direction of a love story, and, and, and I just lean into it. Um, when we think of genetics, when we think of genetic inheritance, we think of physical traits like eye color and hair color, things that are easily observed. But epigenetics is the study of inheriting psychological traits, inheriting 
you know, levels of resiliency and phobias and empathy and, and, and really how people interact with one another. Sometimes we, we inherit a certain ability to love or not love other people. And I was fascinated about that. And the title character, Afong Moi, was a real woman, a real person. She was the first Chinese woman to come to this country in 1834. And she came and there was this moment for a hot minute, she was the most famous woman in America. She toured up and down the eastern seaboard from Maine to Cuba, performing in sold out theaters. And she wore traditional Chinese clothing, she would sing in Chinese, and she had bound feet, which was really kind of the sideshow attraction of her existence. And she was written up in more than 200 newspapers. She had songs written about her, poems written about her. There was a racing horse named after her. She went to the White House and met with President Andrew Jackson at his request. And so she, you know, today kids, they wanna be famous. They wanna be internet famous, they wanna TikTok famous. She was super famous but she had zero agency over her own life. Because all of this excitement, it really obfuscates the fact that at that time, Chinese women couldn't leave China. And if they returned, the punishment was death. And so she wasn't like this cultural ambassador. and She wasn't uh, like a world traveler like Nellie Bly. In all likelihood, she was sold into this life. And in all of these newspaper articles, we never hear from Afong. We only hear from the people who have, who have monetized her. And I wanted to give her a voice. And I wanted to write about her. I had known about her since the 90s. But the last anyone hears about Afong is in the 1840s. And someone reports seeing her living in a poorhouse in New Jersey. And that's it. She disappears from the historical record. And I didn't think there was enough there for me to build a whole story. And certainly there wasn't a redemptive story. It was uh, a story of tragedy. And so in this book, what I've done is I've given her, I've given her fictional descendants. And so the story is this matrilineal line that goes from 18, the 1800s to around 2045. So the book is historical and it's speculative. It's set a little bit hence into the future. And through these generations, I can give her a voice and I can redeem her story a bit. And so I have all these other descendants. There is uh, Zoe Moy, who was a, a, a Chinese girl living in England at a very famous boarding school called Summerhill. It's this very bohemian school that exists to this day. There is a descendant who is living in a contemporary times named Greta, and she's living in Seattle, and she's working in the, the dot-com industry. There is Faye Moy, who is a Chinese nurse working with the Flying Tigers during World War II out of Kunming, China. The main character is actually her descendant, Dorothy, who is living in Seattle in 2045. And so she's the one that, she has a fairly successful life, but she's just burdened by this epigenetic baggage, all of these issues from these previous generations. Um, one of the characters that I, I found fascinating to write about was a character like King Moy. And she is a young girl living in San Francisco in the late 1800s when they had a plague epidemic. They had a, they had a plague epidemic in San Francisco for four years. So I was literally writing about a plague epidemic during a global pandemic. It was very strange. And I, I'm, this part doesn't appear in the book, but it's the historical context. As this plague epidemic was unfolding in California, the California's governor was a man named Henry Gage. He would not acknowledge this was happening because he was afraid it was gonna hurt California's economy and his chance of reelection. There was a doctor who had a vaccine and the doctor and the politician had a war of words in the press with the politician calling the doctor an opportunist. He has a profit motive. He's trying to scare people. Does this sound at all familiar? <laughs> um, the book is about repetitions of behavior. And we literally repeated, as a culture, repeated that cycle 120 years later, the way that plague epidemic was handled. So similar to uh, you know, our... Uh, COVID shut down. Um, but again, that part doesn't appear in the book. But as I'm writing this and I'm just watching the news and writing, I'm just like, 
we're we're in this uh, this cycle of repeat, 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 and the book is very much about that. What I'd like to do is just read just a little snippet, and then we'll talk. And I really, I don't. When it comes to author things, I tend. I tend not to read anything. I'd rather talk and answer questions. But then I found I would go to places and someone's like, I really wanted you to read you know, one page. They just want to hear the story in the author's voice and that's kind of why I do this. The reason why I tend not to do this is I have this, this theory slash paranoia that because we were all read to as children at bedtime, I have this fear that I'm gonna go one page too long and I look up just be like and, I don't want to do that. Um, but the more recent, uh, more recent reason was I did a book event in Coral Gables, California. And I was about to read, and this lovely cotton-haired woman in the back stood up and yelled, we already know how to read. And that's awesome when that happens. Um, <laughs> I, I was so charmed by her, truly. In that moment, I realized Every one of us, myself included, if we are so lucky, we will arrive at an age where we get to say whatever we want <laughs> under any social circumstance. And so I look forward to that moment. Um, I'm gonna start in the beginning. This is, and again, I'm just gonna read like uh, a half a page here. Um, the book opens with Fei Moi in 1942 in Kunming, China. Fei Moi signed a contract stating that she would never marry that's what the American volunteer group had required of all female recruits, though as she sat in the bar of the Kunming Tennis Club, Faye thought that perhaps there should have been an exception made for older nurses. Not that she had any immediate prospects among the 30 young officers who made up the Flying Tigers. It was just that a notarized statement of marital exclusion seemed to hammer home the fact that she'd never been in love. She'd come close once, um, back, in the, back in her village near Canton, amid the wilted lilies of her youth. Since then, she'd felt many things for many people, but always more yearning than devotion, more appreciation than passion. There had even been an awkwardly arranged marriage proposal a lifetime ago at the Toto Koi restaurant where a dashing young man got down on one knee with a ring and too much pomade in his hair. <laughs> Wasted, that's what her father said when she turned him down. Fei Jin, why do you have to be this way? No one likes a stubborn girl. She tried not to roll her eyes. Why can't you call me Fay like everyone else? Because I'm not everyone else. Look at you. You're not getting any younger. You should be happy someone still wants you at your age. And she'd been 27. I'll stop right there. Um, the book, uh, it follows themes of, of loss and abandonment and sort of ripples through all these generations. But I do think it has a, a very redemptive quality to it. I, I, I like uh, reading and also writing novels that take you in a direction. And I think of writing as banking and spending emotional currency with the reader. And so we bank some money and then there's a payoff. And hopefully that uh, is a good one for, for everyone that gets to the, the finish line. Um, I would much rather answer questions. But before we do that, the one question that comes up a lot that I, that I will address is, how'd you get on the Today Show? <laughs> I always wanted to know that. As an author, I'm like, how, how does this happen? What are the mechanics of this happening? There's the celebrity book clubs. There's Reese Witherspoon, there's Oprah, of course, and then there's Jenna, Read with Jenna on the Today Show. And Jenna's is skyrocketing. I mean, it doesn't hurt that she has you know, national television every morning in America, but it's a really beautiful audience. And the way I found out about this was very indirectly. And I was doing a Zoom with a library in Kentucky. And I, I do Zooms with schools and libraries. And, and I'm on the Zoom and there's like 40, 50 patrons. There's a librarian and I'm talking about the book and answering questions. I get off the call and the phone rings and it's my publicist in New York. And she says, okay, we didn't want to tell you ahead of time because we were afraid it would freak you out. But there were people from the Today Show on that Zoom watching you. That doesn't make you paranoid at all. Um, I, and I asked, I said, 
who? And she said, all of them. There were nine people watching me. Um, just to check me out. It, it, for about a week, I was very paranoid. You know, like I'd, I'd order a pizza and the Domino's person gets it. And I get my pizza, I'm like, was that Domino's or was that someone from the Today Show? <laughs> they wanna know if I put pineapple on my pizza. Um, but it's true, they, they were vetting me. Jenna had read the book, loved the book, and she, before I went on the Today Show, she actually optioned it for film before it was even published. So it was this very surreal happening. But when it did come to the Today Show, there was these, it was almost like interviews. And so I had a Zoom meeting with some of her producers. And they are asking questions about my childhood and my life, my parents. And they were trying to find out if I was what I call housebroken for morning national television. <laughs> they want to make sure I'm not a crazy person, or if I'm a crazy person, I'm a stable crazy person. And I'm going to go on national TV, and the, you know, the green light's going to go live, and I'm going to spontaneously combust or something like that. And they're asking me all these questions. And I, I knew they were vetting me, and they wanted to know what I was about. And I said, OK, I can sum up my whole childhood and a lot about who I am today in one sentence. And they're like, okay. And I said, when I was in the fourth grade, my parents sent me to poetry camp. And they're like, yeah, we know who this guy is. <laughs> they're like, uh, let's see, collected comic books? Yes. Uh, played Dungeons and Dragons? Yes. Had a girlfriend in high school, imaginary? Yes. I mean, it was just, they knew, I allayed all their fears with that, uh, with that one moment. Um, and then I went, I, you know, flew out to New York with my agent and my wife. And it was my only rock star moment as an author was when they picked me up at the hotel to go to the Today Show. There's a limousine. I get in the limo, and we drove three blocks, and I got out. <laughs> that was, that was my, my rock star moment. Um, but evidently, there is a unmarked door. And you push a code, it opens up, and someone from NBC sort of whisks you in, and they close the door. They were afraid I was going to miss the door. Um, but I, I went on the show, and it was a lovely experience. And a lot of people were like, you seem so calm. And I, you know, I was thrilled to be there. I was very excited. But I had, had many conversations with Jenna before that, um, who was quite tall, by the way. <laughs> when I met her in person, she's like almost six feet tall. And then she wears heels. You're like, hello. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, she optioned it for a series. There's a screenwriter working on it as we speak. These things may never make it to the screen. My first book, Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, it was optioned seven years ago, and they're just, people ask, like, how's that going? I try not to think about it these days. Um, Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, I think they're on their fourth screenwriter. And I know this is what happens in Hollywood, but for me, it's like you go to a restaurant and it takes seven years for your meal to come out. And then they come out and they're like, it's gonna be great, but we're on our fourth chef, you know? It's, it doesn't really, you know, build confidence, but it's doing its thing, and so we'll see what happens. Um, but I'm very excited about this book. This book, with Hotel on the Corner and Bitter and Sweet, it was so, it had a, it had a zeitgeist moment. And I've learned you cannot manufacture zeitgeist moments. They just happen if you are fortunate. And it created a, a shadow of expectation, of, of comparison with my other books. And it took me a while to write myself out from under that shadow. And now this book has created a new shadow. So <laughs> I have to figure this whole thing out again. Um, but it is, it is nice for so many readers to know me through this book now, who have never read Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, which I find amazing and, and fascinating. Um, and with that, I'd be delighted to answer any questions you might have um, about books, writing, high school visits, anything. My wife says I have this thing called terminal honesty. If you ask me, I'll just tell you. I'm bad at keeping secrets. Hi there. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, and I think this question is even more pertinent having met you now. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, how does your sense of humor inform your writing? Mm. How does my sense of humor inform my writing? This is gonna be a Dr. Phil moment, so brace yourself. <laughs> um, 
Have any of you seen Pat Conroy live? Right here. He's hilarious, right? Um, I've learned that I, I do think humor comes from emotional pain. And Pat was the one, and I love Pat. Um, he said, the greatest gift a writer could ever receive is an unhappy childhood. And for Pat, it was a very unhappy childhood. And I think humor is a way of, of compensating. Um, I've known a couple stand-up comedians, and they're the most depressed people you will ever meet. And it's just, it's, a, it's like a survival instinct, I think, um, to deal with trauma. And so for me, I do. I, I take the work seriously. I don't take myself that seriously. Um, we were talking about that last night. For, for me, author photos are often very serious. It's like, you know, the, the smoking jacket. They're like... And me, I, I, have a, I look like I just sold a book. I'm like, yay! I'm so, I'm so happy. <laughs> so smiling. Um, that, you know, this, I pour my heart and soul into the pages and, and people, people like it. Um, and that's very rewarding. But yeah, the, the humor does come from, uh, from a rough childhood. Uh, mine was not as rough as Pat's, but it was close. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, I often, I don't often see one without the other, unfortunately. Other questions? Yeah, just shout it out. I'll repeat it. Your book goes to so many different times and locations. How do you go about researching that? Oh, yeah, the new book has, you know, my, my first three books are all set in Seattle. This one is set in Seattle, it's set in China, set in England, San Francisco, Baltimore. I do, you know, I just do a ton of research. And the research is different every time. With, with my first book, which deals with the Japanese internment, I, I joined Densho, which records the oral history of the internment. There's 250 interviews that I could watch. I met with people who had been, spent their childhoods in internment camps. They did a lot of research at the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle, all of that stuff. And the great thing is now, I have some best-selling books. So now when I call a museum or historical society, I'm like, I can wave a book around, like, oh, okay. Um, back then, I'm like, I'm a crazy person. I want to go in your archives. Um, but now that, that does help me a lot. With this book, the historical stuff is, I'm, I'm very comfortable researching. I can find books. I can find interviews and talks. And there's always tons of academic papers, academic, you know, someone's thesis has been written about something very specific that I'm looking for. And I can find those things. But the... The part where I was a little out of my depth was the science. Um, it deals with epigenetics and another field of study called optogenetics. Optogenetics is when some scientists at MIT in 2014, they transplanted a memory from one lab animal into another. Um, and I can explain the chapter and verse of, of how that happened. But I had to digest this science and put it on the page in a way that doesn't put readers to sleep, but keeps them engaged and interested. And fortunately, my wife is a nurse. She has an advanced degree in biology. She's a professor of nursing for a while. And I, I would be home trying to synthesize these ideas, and then I would run it by her, and she'd be like, nope, yes, nope, good, close, nope. Um, <laughs> I call it my wife's red pen of destiny because she reads all my manuscripts and marks them up. And she is, uh, she is so wonderful. And she is also very honest. And I need that in a first reader, whether it's uh, writing about the internment or science. Um, I once took photos of my wife's comments on this, this current manuscript and I posted it to social media. And the reaction was, holy cow, Jamie's wife took him to the woodshed. Because <laughs> she would write things like, yeah, I can tell you were, you were, this is near the end of the day. This is kind of, you know, there's kind of lazy writing here. Or, like she was, but it's, it's what I need. It's tough love. Um, I like the research. The research is, it's, you're going down rabbit holes. And we do that. If you go to Wikipedia, and you're looking for an answer, but then you click on this, which leads to this, and you click on this, and like three hours have passed. 
because you've gone down some sort of rabbit hole of knowledge. Uh, I do that with research. I could, I could do research to the exclusion of actually writing the book if I'm not careful. Um, but that's, that's all part of the, the construct of putting this thing together. Thank you. I appreciate that, that question. Tell us a little bit about the uh, environment that you write in. Do you have a little cabin out in the woods? Ooh. What time of day do you write? Uh, <laughs> if you take a day, do you write every day? That sort of thing. The, uh, the environment with which I write, it's changed over time. With Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, all my kids were home. We have a, a Brady Bunch blended family of six children. And so I would be sitting on the bathroom floor with my laptop just to get away. And then I edited the book at the public library um, in Great Falls, Montana, in one of like a little, you know, carol where you can kind of tuck away. I spent my afternoons there editing. Um, when my kids became teenagers, I actually rented a little retail space downtown I mean, above the street level so I have a space to write. But now we're empty nesters, so I have a, a nice home office and um, it's, my, my office looks nice. I, ne I, I always say, because I tend to write, I, I get up in the mornings, I'm an early riser, and I'm wearing my pajamas or I'm wearing sweats and a hoodie. I look, you know, I, it, a good writing day for me is I take a shower at like four in the afternoon because I've just been writing all day. I always say successful writers are also part-time fashion criminals. And I, and I cop to that because I'm just, the actual writing part is very unsexy. It's just me staring at a screen and my dogs are here and my coffee's there. Um, but that's my routine. And I my routine is patterned by my children in that I will write in the morning and I will finish my writing day about three o'clock because that's when the bus would come and I have to be dad. And so I still, I'm still in that pattern. Three o'clock comes around and I'm, I'm wrapping up my day. Um, I'm not always writing. Some authors write, it's almost like religiously. Uh, Chris Bojalian, I love, I think he's just a wonderful guy. And Chris writes every day, no matter what. 1,500 words. His birthday, his Christmas, his anniversary, boom, he's got the words out. I wish I was like Chris. Um, but I, I can't quite do that. I, I tend to charge up my batteries and then just write in a, a flurry for like eight or nine months. And then I need to, to recharge again. Um, and then usually between books, I'm writing short fiction. I get asked to write short stories and stuff like that. And that's a good place to kind of stay fresh and flex my, my muscles a little bit. Yeah, please. Now that you aren't homework, what does your daughter think? <laughs> and then have, now that they're adults, are they fans of, of this new book? Gotcha. Could you hear that question in the back? Um, what she asked was, wow, you're handsome. How did you get so handsome? <laughs> <laughs> God, why'd you do it? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the question was, now that I've, I became homework, I was homework for my daughter. Now my daughter is through college. She's a nurse. And now she's super proud. She's super proud. But during that teenage phase, my first book was optioned for a stage play. So Seattle had, there was a theater that did a, a run. There were 38 sold out shows. They would have continued it longer, they extended the run, but the talent had already committed to other projects. But it, it was very successful. So I, I flew my wife and children out there, and we're sitting there watching this play. And about halfway, she turned to me and said, this is really good. How much of this did you write? <laughs> it's like, all of it. Um, so yeah, it, she is definitely through the butthead phase. Um, but it did, I mean, these moments extended. My son, Lucas, he went away to college. And I was, my first book was their freshman read in college. So he shows up on campus and there's big posters with my face all over campus. He's texting me like, dad, okay, dad, we need to talk. Um, but now they're very happy. And I, and I always encourage them to, you know, pursue what they want to pursue, whether it's in the arts or the sciences. Um, we're all on our own journey. There was a question back there, I think. Yeah, please. What is the common um, trauma that runs through all the daughters? Oh, yeah, what is the trauma that runs through all the daughters? For me, it's, it's abandonment. Um, 
it's, you know, Afon came to this country and she was really a stranger in a strange land. She didn't speak the language. She eventually did because she had a, a tutor and a translator. But, and it's so strange because if she had stayed in China, she may have married into a family and never left the family's compound, as was often the case. The only time she might leave her family's home is to go to a funeral um, for her mother or father and would not have an education, would not have been allowed to travel. And so Afong, when she came to this country, she had all these opportunities, but um, you know, it's like one of us going to a country where we don't speak the language and then we are just, our destiny is in someone else's hands. And so for her, I think all of us to some degree grapple with some sort of abandonment. I mean, I certainly do. But she was someone that in all likelihood was sold by her parents. She was promised that she would return in two years and that promise went unfulfilled because she was so successful and her promoters, they, she was worth more. Um, and so, yeah, it's... Uh, she was, it, was, it wasn't Lloyds of London, but it was someone like that. Her promoters insured her, her well-being, for $5,000. And in today's dollars, that's like, you know, $150,000 as far as a, like a life insurance policy. So she was very valuable, but she, you know, she didn't get to control her own life. And so much of the book is this ripple of abandonment. And also, there's heartache. There's a love story that repeats itself again and again and again in a somewhat tragic way until you get to closer to the end of the book. And that is often repeated. Yes, please. In one of your interviews, I heard you say that uh, when they said, well, that's a pretty tough book till you get to the end. And you said, uh, Actually, it was even going to be a little tougher, but one of my actors said, hey, come on, please, you've got to give the audience a little bit of help here. Oh, my. Is that true? It is true. Yeah, the book was, the, the thing is, when I write a book, and it goes back to your question of, of how I go about it, I always know my ending before I begin writing. And my ending becomes my compass north. I write towards it. I don't outline every chapter, but I might have a synopsis, and I know the emotional payoff that I want the book to have. And so I knew there was going to be this redemptive note. And because of that, I often will make the book more tragic than it needs to be. Because I my compass is so direct that I'm like, it's fine if all these terrible things happen, because I know this happens. The reader doesn't know that. Um, I actually, for those of you who have read the book, the main character, Dorothy, in my original manuscript, I killed her off in the end. I know. I, and my, my wife reads everything, so she's sitting across the living room reading the book, and she got to that part, and she just looked up at me, and she said, F you! She was so mad! She was like, you can't do that! That's horrible! And I was like, oh, I went a little too far. Um, and it was my editor who, uh, he, my editor is so wonderful, and she pulled me aside, and I'll never forget, she said, Jamie, we want to make sure the reader survives the journey. <laughs> and there's some truth to that. Um, and, and so I, I do keep that in mind. Yes, please. You've spoken a great deal about your first book and your latest book. Can you say a little about the intervening titles? I would love books? to. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll touch briefly on my second book and a little more on the third because it's very germane to where we're at. Uh, my second book, Songs of Willow Frost, it, it actually, it's my darkest book and it's kind of my favorite. It's about a boy who's never known his father. He last saw his mother when she was being taken to the hospital. He th thinks he hasn't heard from her in years. He's living in an orphanage in Seattle, Sacred Heart Orphanage during the Depression. It was a real orphanage. And once a year at, at Sacred Heart, if the boys were good, they take them to town to go see a, a silent picture. And they go see a movie, and on the screen is a woman that he recognizes as his mother. And it's about what happened between them. Um, that, I really like that book, but there was a while there where I didn't 
because Hotel was like this. And then my follow-up, it debuted at number 11 on the New York Times bestseller list, but it still felt like failure because of the sales metrics. You could just not compare the two. It's not often you debut on the Times bestseller list and just feel like, ah, oh, failed again. Um, and I don't read my own books. Um, it's not like I write it and I go home and like, I'm going to read a little bit of me tonight. Um, I mean, we just, I don't do that. There's too many books to read. Authors, we don't do that. But my, my wife loved that book and she really encouraged me to give it a read. And I was flying to Alaska to visit a high school and I read it. And you know what? It's a really good book. <laughs> I couldn't believe I wrote it. I was like, wow, this is much better than I remember. Um, my third book, Love and Other Consolation Prizes. It's about the World's Fair in 1909. Um, Seattle had two World's Fairs. There was the one in 62 that Elvis went and filmed a movie. And then there was the one in 1909, which was called the Alaska Pacific, or Alaska Yukon Pacific, AYP, Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. And at that World's Fair, they had themed days. So they have a theme and a prize. So on Agriculture Day, they raffled off a milking shorthorn cow. And on Mining Day, they raffled off 3,000 copper ingots. And on September 15th, 1909, the day President Taft visited the World's Fair, it was Washington Children's Day, and they raffled off a child. <laughs> and his name was Ernest. He was donated by the Washington Children's Receiving Home. And no one knows whatever happened to this boy. And I did tons of research, and the, the records were all destroyed in the 30s from the, uh, the receiving home, so nobody knows. And so I used his life as uh, a blank canvas, and I tell the story. And Seattle in 1909, it had this vibrant suffrage movement. They had the National Suffragette Convention, and it also had this vibrant red light district, which was funded by the mayor. And that's the one idea you didn't have, Mayor, <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Um, have time. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't get that out of committee. Um, and so I have this boy, Ernest, won by a woman named Florence Nettleton, who was a real person in Seattle, better known as Madame Flora. And she ran this very fancy parlor joint, sporting house, which is all a fancy way of saying she ran a brothel. And it's a very innocent coming of age story, but it's set in this salacious world. And as I was about to go out on book tour for that book, my publicist said, you know, you really should write about your personal experiences as they relate to the book. <laughs> I don't know how much time y'all have spent in brothels. <laughs> I don't know if there's a median average for brothel time in America, but I am well below it. Um, but I do a fair amount of research, um, not that kind of research, but I, I found a woman in Seattle who was an expert on Seattle's historical red light district. And she had written newspaper articles, she had been on television, national television, commenting on uh, women's rights. I contacted her and asked if I could interview her for research. I met her for coffee. Her name was Maggie. And it turned out Maggie was a high paid escort. Maggie was also a public librarian. <laughs> Maggie changed my opinion of sex workers and librarians over one <laughs> cup of coffee. So um, I just have to share that with you because of the, the library connection. Like, we got, we got our eyes on you. We want to know what you're up to. Okay. Um, other questions? Yes, please. What, who do you read and what do you read? Who do I read? What do I read? I read everything. I, I'm, I'm always a, a little bummed when people are kind of genre snobs, and there's often authors that we're the worst at that. We're like, I don't read those type of books or I don't read those type of books. I wanna read the best of everything. That's like saying, I don't wanna eat that food or that food. I'm only gonna eat pot roast for the rest of my life. Like I wanna sample everything. And so um, old and new. So some recent books that I just finished, uh, I read Daisy Jones and the Six. Uh, I read The Seven uh, Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. I. Um, I'm in a book club. I'm in a guy's book club, which is weird. That's not supposed to exist. Um, it's theoretical, like a, like a unicorn. But I've been in a guy's book club for 11 years now, and we just read Lincoln and the Bardo for, for book club. Um, 
I'm listening to a book called How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, who was, and then it was a very popular book and it's very interesting. Um, and I recently read, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's about Laurel Canyon, um, the history of this neighborhood in California where all of these musicians came from. And then later all these tragedies happened there, like the Manson murders happened in Laurel Canyon. Um, so fiction, nonfiction, graphic novels, poetry, you name it, I, I read it. And sometimes it's just kind of on a whim. Uh, last year I had, I just binged, I, I've read most of everything that Pat Conroy has written, he's one of my idols, but there are biographies written about him. So I read three consecutive biographies and then I read Death of Santini, which is his own uh, biography, autobiography. Um, and oddly enough, the next week the Conroy Center um, in Beaufort, South Carolina, called me and asked if I wanted to, to do an event there. So sometimes the universe works in very mysterious ways. Other questions? Yes, please. What uh, was your inspiration for becoming a writer and at what age? I, I swear, I didn't have much of a choice. Like, my, par my parents did send me to poetry camp. I was that kid. My, my mom wanted me to be a writer. My dad wanted me to be an artist, which is... It's tough for a parent, because I raise kids and both of my sons are musicians, and there was a part of me that was just like, oh man, be an accountant, be an accountant. <laughs> Something that's, that's reliable. But I make my living in the arts, I have to encourage them to uh, pursue those dreams, and, um, and they're, they're doing great. Um, for me, you know, I was always a creative kid. I, I wanted to be a comic book artist, I wanted to to write movies. I, I just always wanted to create. And it wasn't until I was in my late 30s that it started to come together. And that's when both my parents died. Um, it sounds kind of heavy. I don't mean for it to sound so heavy, but I often say my writing career began when I wrote my parents' obituaries. Before that, I had tried to write, but I didn't have a very deep emotional point of view. But once I lost my parents, suddenly my stories came alive. There was an emotional resonance there. And I often tell you know, kids in high school, I say, don't go out on purpose to collect scars, but it, you have to have your heart broken a few times if you want to write about emotional things, I think. And for me, it was all of these things that I thought were my weaknesses as a teenager actually became my superpowers as a writer that sentimentality, that, um, you know, wearing my heart on my sleeve and being that kid. So a bit of a late bloomer, but I've been striving for it for, for most of my life, from, from grade school on. Yes, please. So this question was inspired or generated by your last name. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm wondering if you would talk about your experience of writing as a Chinese American. Yeah, you know, I'm half Chinese on my dad's side. Um, my dad spoke Cantonese fluently. I, I was interesting, I was talking to a, a young student at the high school and she's Chinese by a, adoption and she's a teenager. Teenagers are always grappling with who am I? Who am I gonna be? And it's complicated even more when there's another component like, like race. She's, she's very struggling to find out who she is, even though she has very loving, supportive parents, and she's very grateful for them. They are her parents, but she comes from someplace else. Um, for me, I never felt Chinese enough. I didn't speak Chinese, and I'd go to Chinese gatherings, and they're all speaking Chinese, and I, I just didn't. But I never felt white enough because my dad ran a Chinese restaurant and you could walk in our house, you would know it's a Chinese American house because it's just the, the decor. And, um, and my friends would come over and we're eating very, we're eating things that most white kids don't eat. And suddenly I feel very self-conscious there too. So I, I never quite fit in. And I turned all that onto the page. Um, it, all that angst, all of that doubt, all of that confusion, that grappling for who I am, I really poured that into my first book. And it also let me revisit my dad's childhood because he was the same age as my main character, Henry, during World War II. 
And that became, uh, I, you know, I wrote my first book almost for therapeutic reasons, and then it blew up, and I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll just write what's inside of me. Um, but I have the last name Ford, and, so, and I'm, I'm fairly white passing, and so I'm kind of stealth Asian, you know? <laughs> it's true. Like, if I, if I showed you a picture of what I looked like from high school on, I was this skinny little kid with longer hair, and I looked very Chinese, but I, I've sort of, uh, I, I entered this white passing era. And with my last name, it does create some ambiguity. And I often wonder if I would have as much success if I was Jamie Chung, which is a family name. When I sold Hotel, there were, it sold at auction, so there are numerous publishers who wanted it. And when that happens, you get to interview your editors to see who you want to work with. And one editor really wanted me to write under a, a Chinese surname. And I mean, I could have written under Jamie Chung or Jamie Chu, but that's not who I actually am. And it, I know it's a little confusing, but it makes for an interesting story to talk about my great grandfather and his journey of assimilation in this country. And, but I do sometimes think like maybe I, I, I'm, I get a break because I, I have a very Caucasian sounding name. It's very similar to, uh, Janine Cummins, who wrote uh, American Dirt, which is about the border. And I mean, that's a whole controversial book, the, the, the behind the story of that book. But if her name was Luis Alberto Urea, who was one of my dear friends, um, who his books have not sold like Janine's, um, maybe, Maybe that name comes with some cultural baggage and you're just assuming it's gonna be this when it might be that. I'm not sure. Someone will write a doctoral thesis on that one day in <laughs> social, sociology class. One more. Oh, yeah, one more question. I have one. Yeah, yeah please. What's on your t-shirt? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's, it says, uh, it's, it's a band. It's, it's a, uh, let's see. It's, it's, yeah, it's a band called Arm's Length, and my son, bo my, both my sons are musicians. One teaches uh, high school music in Minnesota, and the other one is a working musician out of Chicago. And this is not his band. He actually plays for a band that went on tour with this band, and he gave me the shirt. And I'm like, oh, I like that shirt. So, um, and I actually really like their music, which I'm not sure if a 54-year-old should have the musical taste of a 13-year-old you know, girl, but there it is. Um, yeah, uh, Arm's Length plays emo music. It's just kind of this very, uh, I was, my wife calls it whiny white boy music. It's just like, it's like teenagers, just like, just like broken-hearted teenagers just going for it. So that's, that's kind of my speed. Um, I will be happy to stay after and take pictures and sign books and answer any other questions you might have. Thank you so much for having me. I told Jamie uh, last night he, he loved Pat Conroy as his, his hero. I, I noticed that he stayed behind the podium today. For those of you who were here to hear Pat Conroy here several years ago may remember that he asked for a lavalier mic and he walked up and down the stage for an hour with his pants unzipped. <laughs> and, uh, I told Jamie that last night. I noticed he stayed behind the podium. So, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, Jeff, I guess if you want to set us off, but uh, Jamie, thank you. Oh, thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for being here. Uh, once again, thank you to the Tupelo Reads Committee. And of course, thank you, Jamie, for making this a uh, memorable event. And he, uh, Jamie will be around to sign and uh, talk to you uh, to the left here. Thank you. Well done.